Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Backend Developer Fundamentals course. In this course, you'll develop skills on using databases, including PostgreSQL. We'll also look at NoSQL databases. You'll learn how to develop server-side applications using Node.js. And finally, you'll learn the basics of how to deploy those applications. So you'll be developing applications on your development machine, like a laptop or a desktop. Finally, you'll learn, well, how do we deploy this to a web server somewhere so people can actually access them and use this application you wrote? You'll find that there are many places online to learn this material, but I'm hoping you'll find this course to be a super effective and fun way to help you get started on your mastery of backend development. Making the wrong choice on how to learn this material may lead to a journey of frustration. If you're just getting started, kind of randomly selecting YouTube videos and online tutorials and all these are using different tools and have different methods and there's different material, that, of course, isn't the best approach. If you want to develop some solid skills, you'll get better results if you start with one system and follow it through. And I'd like it to be this one. Since you're watching this video, I'm thinking maybe you already know what a backend developer is, but let me just review that. We all interact with web applications. That seems to be the majority of what we do with our laptops and our desktops. So, for example, here's Amy, and suppose she's going to LinkedIn to look at jobs. So, Amy's typing away, she's using a browser, and that browser makes a request through the internet to a server at LinkedIn somewhere. So, there's a request made. Show me this page. That server has a response back to Amy's laptop. And that response can consist of a bunch of information. And this information is of three major types. It could be code, it could be assets, or it could be some data. And let me just elaborate a bit more on these. So code are things like HTML, CSS, or cascading style sheets, or JavaScript that will run on the client machine, on Amy's machine. Assets can be image files. So at LinkedIn, maybe a logo appears on the page. So that logo is an image file. So that needs to be loaded onto Amy's browser. It could be audio files when you're going to Spotify or something. Or it could be video files. Those would be assets. And finally, it could be some data. And it'll be in this commonly in a form called JSON. We'll look at this a little bit later in the course. Let's go into a bit more detail on that code block. So code can be HTML, as we said, and that defines kind of the content of what that web page is. So here we see in the LinkedIn example, we see find the right job or internship for you, who is LinkedIn for. So the content of the web page. CSS defines how that content looks on Amy's browser. So what's the font? What are the colors used? Where is that logo positioned on the page? What's the width and height of something? So these are all part of CSS. And finally, there's JavaScript, JavaScript that will run on Amy's browser. All these, HTML, CSS, and client-side JavaScript, are part of front-end development and define the user experience, defines the content that Amy sees on the page, defines how that content looks on the page, and defines how Amy can interact with that content. That's all user experience and part of front-end development. So again, to review, a browser makes a request to the web server for a specific web page. So there's this request being made. That server responds with a response to the browser consisting of information, which the browser will use to display. And that response can consist of code, assets, and data. And a particular importance here is that CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. And that CSS, HTML, and JavaScript enable a website to be responsive. That means that whether it's a laptop that's requesting the information, a tablet, or a phone, it can alter its appearance but still have that content onto the page. So you might go to LinkedIn and it'll look different on a phone, but the material will still be the same. It's just being displayed differently. As part of this, which I've mentioned a couple of times now, there's JavaScript, which is executing within the browser. So JavaScript that's running on client side. And these provide the interactions with the user. It provides things that maybe the user doesn't even need to go back to the server. It can scroll through some information. Maybe some information zooms in. Maybe we see some summary of various things. A bunch of interaction that can occur without having to go to the server. But eventually, Amy will be interested in a job, click, and will need 
to get that information from the server. So when data is needed, hey, show me the information about this particular job, this client-side JavaScript can send a request to the server. And on the server, everything involved in servicing and responding to that user request is part of back-end development. So writing the HTML, CSS, and client-side JavaScript, that's front-end development, defining the user experience. Back-end development is all the code responsible for servicing requests. And this would be the server-side code. Oftentimes, it's a scripting language like JavaScript that processes requests. Many of these requests, or perhaps the majority of them, involve accessing databases. So we need to get some information from database servers. And finally, we need to package up this information and send it to a user's browser. So this is all part of back-end development, part of the back-end. Let's just look at some examples here. So here I'm at LinkedIn. And I've already done this search over here, so let me just click on it, Node.js backend developer Austin, Texas. That's what I'm looking for. And here we get some information. Now, if I view page source here, you'll see that LinkedIn is trying to save bandwidth by kind of condensing everything and eliminating as many spaces as possible and the new lines as possible, so things look a little confusing. Let me just zoom in a whole slew here and see if this looks like HTML. I'm really hoping it does. So I zoomed in, and it looks sort of like HTML. I'm sorry that it's all condensed. It's the way it works in LinkedIn. But I'm hoping when you look at it a bit, you'll see that, yes, indeed, it is HTML. It also sends JavaScript that I put in a different tab here. So this is the file that is sent to your browser. Of course, it's still missing spacing, nice formatting, but I'm hoping you'll see that even if you don't know JavaScript, you'll see that, hey, this does look like a programming language. Here we have a return statement. Here we have, let's see if we can find, here we have an if statement. So there's, here's where we declare a variable, let E equals an empty list. So it sends HTML, JavaScript. It also sends this cascading style sheet. And as you can see, let me zoom in some more. So you can see that it does indeed contain information about how to display things. Like here we have some margin padding, what the font is. The background's transparent. Here we have what fonts to use. So LinkedIn, when you make the initial request to the server, sends back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Let's look at a different web page. Here I'm going to the World Library Catalog, and I'm just going to type in a search element long. And again, I'm going to view page source, and I'm going to make this bigger. And if I scroll down, we'll hopefully see different types of information. So here we get some code, some JavaScript code in the file, and it's formatted so it actually looks like JavaScript and looks like a programming language. If I scroll a little further down, I'm getting into a part that actually looks like HTML, right? We have a table and other ele HTML elements. And finally, let's see if we can find the cascading style sheet. I'm going to scroll up and look for... Okay, so here's a number of, of cascading style sheet files that are loaded in when, that, when we request that page. And let me just go to one. I'll try um, this one here. And again, it looks like information from a style sheet that tells us the margin, the font weight, and things like that. So when we make the initial request to a website, we commonly get back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that's intended to run in the browser. So is this what happens? Every time we make a request to the server, we get back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? Well, hopefully not. Let me explain it a bit more. So here's Amy looking at LinkedIn. And suppose she clicks on that Wikibuy software engineer job posting. So the old school way of doing things would be to return HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all the assets like the logos. So I show a little bit of HTML here. And as you can imagine, it's a big package of information. All that stuff, every time she makes a query, we send all that blomming back to her. So that's the old way. Make a request to a server and get all this HTML, CSS, JavaScript back. That's not the way modern systems usually work. We're trying to keep that exchange of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and assets to a minimum. So if Amy clicks on that Wikibuy job ad, a more modern response 
is to use something called JSON. We'll cover this a bit later. But basically, it's sending just the data. Once Amy clicks on that ad, Wikibuy, it sends this basic information. What's the description of the job? What's the basic qualifications? What are the preferred qualifications? All the information needed about the job. Amy already has on her browser HTML from LinkedIn, CSS, JavaScript. So it has all the necessary stuff. Once it gets this data, it knows how to display it, right? JavaScript can convert this form, once it receives it, into a form that's displayed very nicely on Amy's laptop or on Amy's tablet or Amy's phone. So the modern way is for a back-end server to deliver data as much as possible. So front-end development is responsible for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that runs on the client. Back-end development is responsible for everything that runs on the server, particularly accessing databases. So what do employers look for when they're hiring back-end developers? Well, we've been looking at LinkedIn. Let's just continue that. And let's look at that Wikibuy ad. All right, so the basic qualifications include two years of experience with Node.js. I typed that in my search, so that's not a surprise. We see that they want experience with modern relational databases like Postgres and MySQL and Redshift, and experience with distributed technologies such as Cassandra and Elasticsearch. Let's look at another job. Let's look at Bethesda Game Studios. They list experience with design and implementation of REST style API experience with SQL or NoSQL databases and data modeling, experience working with source control like Git. So in talking to backend developers, here's the list I came up with of the kind of the hot skills, the necessary skills that people look for in entry-level backend developers. So you need to know about SQL databases and gain some experience with SQL databases, both the nuts and bolts of SQL databases, how to create a database, how to design a database, how to insert data into a database, how to query a database. And in addition to this nuts and bolts stuff, you need to know kind of the overarching thing of when you'd use one, what are the pros and cons of an SQL database, and when would you select like a NoSQL alternative like Cassandra. So for this, we're going to learn PostgreSQL. It's a real popular database, particularly among startups. So that's what we'll use in this course. Another thing you'll need is some experience writing web services. This includes basic fluency with JavaScript, knowing about how to do asynchronous I.O. and what that is, obviously how to use JavaScript to connect to databases, and then learn how to write real-time web applications. For this, we're going to be using Node.js, which is JavaScript. You'll need to have some experience designing and implementing APIs or application programming interfaces. This defines clearly defined methods for communicating with a web server. You also need experience with NoSQL databases such as Cassandra, Redis, Elasticsearch, and we'll cover these much later in the course. So you should be comfortable with developer tools, so whatever development environment you're using on your laptop or desktop, what editor you're using, what other tools do you have, and you should also know about versioning systems like Git and some other systems like Postman. So we'll cover those in this course as well. You'll also need some knowledge of how backends are deployed. Maybe other people on your team will be doing this, but at least you need to know how to get from your laptop to some application in the cloud. And for this, in this course, we'll be using Google Cloud Services and looking at things like Nginx reverse proxy servers, things along those basic lines. And you should also have a basic knowledge of front-end development. So this is a front-end developer's job, obviously, the stuff we've been talking about, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But since your code is going to interface with that, it's good to have some basic knowledge of how all that works. So this is the basic design of the course. The first module has to do with PostgreSQL. So here's where we're going to learn those basic nuts and bolts things about SQL databases, and in particular, PostgreSQL. This includes how to design and create databases, how to insert data into a database, and how to query a database. From there, we'll move on to a module on Node.js. Here we'll learn the basics of just gaining a little bit of basic fluency with JavaScript, learning about asynchronous I.O., how to connect to a database, how to write web application servers, so the bare minimum you'll need in order to write a complete web app. So with those two modules done, we'll have a basic web application, but it'll be running on your development environment, whether it's a laptop or a desktop. From there, we're going to have a very short module having to do with deployment. So once we have it 
on our laptop, how do we deploy it to a web server running on a server wherever that server is? From there, once we get this basic core pie-shaped thing, our basic skills, we can write a basic server, we'll grow our knowledge. That's what these concentric circles are. So we'll learn a little bit more about PostgreSQL, when to use it, what are the best use cases for PostgreSQL or any SQL databases, and when should we use a NoSQL database like Cassandra. We'll also learn more in-depth knowledge about Node.js. So that's what these concentric circles do. So we're going to get a basic thing running as quickly as we possibly can, the inner core, and then grow our knowledge. I think the skills you'll learn in this course will be applicable to you regardless of whether you want to gain some background developer skills to implement a great idea you have or you want to gain these skills in order to make you more competitive for a job. So I'd like to welcome you to the course. I hope you find it fun and an effective way of learning these skills. Thanks. Bye.